turn to Acts chapter 17 again with me, please. Acts chapter 17. As I said in our Selah time this morning, ever since the Garden of Eden, when human beings sin, our tendency as humans has been toward idolatry. You know, that was not just a problem that the Apostle Paul faced here in Acts 17 in the city of Athens. But even now, idolatry is a big problem. In fact, as I said, even Christians at times drift into idolatry. Idolatry is exactly what Paul is up against. If you look at the, the 16th verse in Acts chapter 17, but you know what? The fact of the matter is, idolatry is exactly what we are up against in New York City here in this very uh, year of 2023. 20, uh, idolatry. Look at what he says. Verse 16. While Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in hell. What about? When he saw the city wholly given idolatry. You know, I think about that. that. That, to me, is striking. Because you know what life in the city is like, right? Life in the city, I mean, the city has a very real underbelly, they call it. It is just full of immorality. But isn't it interesting that the thing that stirred Paul is probably different than what stirs us. We get stirred about the immorality, and, I, and you know, I understand that. I get stirred about that. <clears throat> but do we understand that the basis for immorality is idolatry? That when people turn away from God and turn to everything else, that immorality flows in, you know, Romans chapter 1 bears this out. In the second half of that uh, first chapter of Romans, Paul says that when mankind as a, uh, as a society or a culture turns away from God, don't want to retain God anymore in their thoughts. Guess what happens? They turn to all kinds of filth. All kinds of immorality begins to flood into that culture, into that society. It's idolatry that leads to immorality. In fact, Paul warns believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, don't be like the ancient Israelites were there in the wilderness. How that, remember, they worshiped that golden calf. They turned to idolatry, and when Moses... And Joshua come down off of Mount Sinai. They hear the noise. And it is people that are involved in really debauchery. And it was idolatry that led into that. Paul in verse 16 of Acts 17 is deeply, deeply troubled by the rampant idolatry that he sees. But I think you need to understand this. He's troubled about idolatry because of the ancient Jewish worldview, which I want to share with you as we begin. What is the ancient Jewish worldview about idolatry? Well, let's pause a moment and pray and then look to the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can come before you once again this morning. We need you. We thank you that you are always there. We can call upon you, and uh, you hear us, and you work in the behalf of your people. When we believe upon you, when we really trust you and desire to follow you. So today, Lord, I'm asking, would you give a spirit anointing, not just to your messenger, but also to your listeners? that we might receive precisely what you want us to. Do that work in us 
that you only can do. Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear and that we would have hearts to follow. Just, we want to lift up Jesus. We want him to be glorified by the choices and by the decisions that people make in response to your word today. We pray for his sake. Amen. So I really believe that the ancient Jewish worldview that impacts their thoughts regarding idolatry would have to, of necessity, take us back to Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 11, we have the account of what is called the Tower of Babel. And you remember how that the Lord uh, came down to see the city and the tower that the children of men built it. And the scripture says that God said, the people is one. They have all one language, and this they begin to do, and nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do, go to. Let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Now, I believe that this passage is really at the heart of the Old Testament Jewish person's worldview. What's going on here at Babel is something very sinister. It's idolatry, obviously. It's uh, sinister activity and, uh, and knowledge. And we see from these verses that the result is that uh, God dispersed the nations. He dispersed them all over the earth. But I don't think that that's the total story. I don't think that we understand the whole picture unless we link it with another biblical passage. And so I turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is in the Song of Moses. And uh, this is uh, uh, Moses' last song uh, to the children of Israel before he passes away. And in these words, he says, beginning in verse 8, When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, <clears throat> he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. One of the things that I would point out here is that God not only dispersed the nations of the earth, but in this passage, it's clear that he disinherited the nations of the earth. His dispersal of them resulted in them being disinherited by, the, by him. It's the same thing, again, that we read about in Romans 1, that when a people turn from God, that God gives them over that God gives them up to whatever they want to follow. And that's what's taking place here. This is part of the Old Testament worldview. And it is judgment. It's the judgment of God that took place at Babel, that God decided that he was no longer going to be in a relationship with the nations of this earth, but rather he was going to start over. And he was going to, as verse 9 says, enter into a special relationship with a new people. He was going to establish a covenant with a new people. We know that that begins with Abraham. Verse 8 says that God set the bounds of the nations, the people, according to the number of the children of Israel. Oh, wait a minute. There is another understanding of that phrase. Since the Dead Sea Scrolls have been uh, discovered and have uh, been deciphered, we understand that that phrase, children of Israel, is better translated, children uh, or sons of 
gods. The Septuagint version, which is a great translation of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, supports that same reading. And so I believe that when God judged the nations at Babel and dispersed them and disinherited them, he put them over in the authority of the heavenly hosts, these gods that are called in the Bible uh, plural. The, the word God, small g, in the Hebrew scripture is the word Elohim. And so the context determines on who the God or gods are. And here, it's that the Lord is dividing the nations uh, and their inheritance according to the number of the, the, the sons of God. That is, that God judged the rebellious nations at Babel, took those nations of the world and placed them under the authority of these gods, which of course we know from Psalm 82 that in the future God is going to judge these heavenly hosts for their corrupt administration of the nations of this earth. Uh, I'm not going to turn there, but Psalm 82, verses 6 and 7 bears this out. So I want you to understand that this is what's behind the idolatry and the worldview of ancient uh, Jewish people. This is what Paul, this is what's stirring him when he sees the idolatry there in Athens. He understands that behind that idolatry, there are wicked spirit beings that are, that are corrupting human beings and that are leading them away from the God, the true and living God. And this stirs him deeply. You know, the commandment in the Torah is uh, that uh, they were not to have any other gods. They were not to make images of any uh, gods. In the ancient Near East, idols represented gods, and the gods were thought to reside in those idols. And so the Torah... The commandments prohibited idolatry, because, and they were not to make any gods, uh, any image of gods, because you know what God's image is? God's image is you and me. God's image are people, and uh, God wants to reside with us, and he wants to reside in us, and so in essence, idolatry is trading the presence of God with you and in you for anything lesser or anything else. And so this is behind Paul's deep stirring, being deeply troubled when he sees the city of Athens given over to all of these false gods, these idols. Well, what does it take to straighten all of this out, what does it take to counter this kind of idolatry? Well, I think we have to go to the Bible, and we counter idolatry with theology. And so the sin of idolatry, it has always been a great human problem, and it requires that uh, we look at the Scripture and see what the Scripture says, and that's exactly what Paul is doing here. So if you have your Bible open now to uh, Acts chapter 17, going back there again, I want us to pick up in verse uh, 24, because here is Paul now before the Athens City Council. That's what the Areopagus is. He's there before the town council. Uh, you know, New York City has a, a council, right? You have a city council. Well, Athens had one too. And Athens is a place, I should say, that is so full of idolatry. There, the population in Paul's day was about 10,000 people, but it was said that there were 40,000 gods uh, that were represented in the city of Athens. You would be, uh, it would be easier to find a false god than it would be to find a person in the city of Athens. That's how far-reaching this is. 
But look at Paul's message as he stands before the city council and, and confronts this idolatry. I think there are some things that we can gather from this that we can use in confronting idolatry in our city in this day. And the first thing he does, I'm going to read them so you can uh, see them again, is he reveals the God of the Bible as the maker, as the creator. Notice what he says in verse 24. God made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth and dwelleth not in temple made with hands. We'll get back to that in a moment. But he first begins his message by presenting God, the God of the Bible, as the maker. And all of the nation's origins, God brought them into existence from a common ancestor. His name was Adam. We know that. And then he says in that uh, 24th verse, he talks about the maker being uh, having transcendence. By that I mean he's because he created all. He's supreme over all. He's infinitely above all. And yet don't, don't forget the fact that although God is so high that we cannot comprehend him, he's very personal. And he's involved with us on an individual level. And that's amazing to me. Only God could, could do that. Look at verse 25. More information about this maker. In 24, he says he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, saying he gives to all life and breath and all things. Here is the maker's sufficiency. He doesn't need human sustenance. Humans don't sustain God. God sustains humans. God made humans and he sustains them. Humans try to, sus to sustain gods by appeasing them so that they can gain favor for what they need. It doesn't work that way. God does not need men to sustain him. God sustains human beings, and here we are told that God graciously gives to all human beings whatever they need, whether they deserve it or not. <laughs> the fact of the matter is God graciously gives to all. He causes his reign, Jesus said, to fall on the just and the unjust. And so he is the maker. We see his transcendency. And his sufficiency as Paul begins to present him. And then in verse 26, he says in the second part, He giveth to all life and breath and all things. It says in verse 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Let it be very clear that regardless of any other categories that organizations might give to humans, there's only one race, and that race is the human race. We, he says it so clearly in that 26th verse, he hath made of one blood all nations. All people come from Adam, all people share the same blood. We are made of one blood. He's not only the maker, but in these verses we're going to see that he is the master. By that I mean he is the sovereign ruler, and as such, he's, very, he's a big benefactor. Because God is the sovereign ruler. He blesses nations by ordering their circumstances, first of all, look at verse 26. He's made all nations to dwell on the face of the earth, and he's appointed their time. 
He's appointed their time. He is the master in dealing with the nations historically. By that I mean God takes the nations and he puts them in their specific place in history. The rise and fall of nations or empires is not left to fate. But God personally predetermines the rise and fall of nations. He makes that so clear when he gives the predictions and the prophecies like he does in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. These empires, these nations just didn't happen to arrive on the scene at that moment. God appointed the very time when they would rise and the time when they would fall and predicted it all because he's the one that orchestrates it. So he's the master of nations historically. But also, he's the master of nations geographically. Look at verse 26 once again. He's also appointed the bounds of their habitation, their geographical borders. God has personally set the precise borders of nations. And I think that this is vitally important because if we go back to that ancient Jewish worldview, that all the nations are under the authority of these heavenly hosts, uh, these, uh, these gods, then that's why there is friction between the nations, is because there are rulers of the darkness of this world. There is spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies among these heavenly hosts that are corruptly ruling these nations and are trying to expand their cosmic geography, you might say. Israel is holy ground, the nation of Israel, and their geographic boundaries are holy ground because God has appointed their place and their dwelling. Territory that the nations occupy, belonging to these corrupt gods that are behind the nation and all of the leaders, that territory, through God's redemption plan, is little by little being won back. You know what the job of missions is? You know what the task of evangelism is? We're seeking to regain and reclaim the territory that these corrupt gods have turned the nations away from the true God. And that's really what's going on. And that's why God is the master of nations, not only historically and geographically, but also spiritually. Look again with me in verse 27. He has set the time for them existing and the boundaries geographically, that they should seek the Lord. If happily they may feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any of us, for in him we live, move, and have our being. So, very clearly, all fits God's redemption plan. God's planning to rescue and recover that's his program. That's, again, what missions and evangelism is about. It's God's rescue and recovery program of the nations of this earth, of people, of humanity. The nations to be reclaimed by God. One way he does that is through missions. One way he does that is through you and I witnessing where he puts us, by being faithful witnesses to him. Another way he does that is he has promised in these last days to pour out his Holy Spirit upon all flesh. That's all nations. That's all people. When's that going to happen? Well, it, it's happened in different spots at different times in these last days. But I think it will continue, and I think it's really going to crescendo in the future when he pours out his Spirit after the church has been taken out and taken to be with the Lord. But the promise 
that God will pour out his spirit on the nations. He uses spiritual awakening to restore and to reclaim the nations. That's why we pray for the revival of the church, so that uh, we would be right and we could be the instruments through which a spiritual awakening to, could, could grip a city like this or could grip a, a nation and thus restore them and reclaim them for the war. And then look with me, if you will, <clears throat> down to verse 30. Because Here's the third thing I wanted to share with this morning. We considered idolatry, and we considered the theology that really counters idolatry. Now I want you to see liability. There is a liability that every human being in all nations face. He talks about it in uh, verses uh, 30 <clears throat> and uh, down to 32. He says, the times of this ignorance, that is, where people would worship these false gods. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because God's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Jesus the Messiah, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all, all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they mocked. But some said, we'll hear you again on this matter, but certain, verse 34, believe. There's coming a day when the judge, when God, the one who we pictured here, who is pictured here as the maker and as the master, He's going to stand forth on one day as the judge. And he is going to call all into account. First of all, he is going to call the nations into account. Did you know that some of the last things that Jesus shared with his disciples uh, is that before his death is that there's coming a day when all the nations of the earth are going to stand before Jesus. And the nations that believe on the right hand, the nations that reject him on the left hand, and their belief will be, uh, will be evidenced by the way that they treat the Jewish people in that day, during that time of Jacob's trouble. But the nations of the earth are going to be judged by Jesus, this one, this man that he says in verse 31, that God has ordained. There's a national judgment coming. The Bible warns us in Psalm 9, I think it's verse 17, that the nations that forget God, the nations that reject him, will be turned into hell will face God's judgment for all eternity. Nations perishing. But can I remind you that nations are made up of individuals? And so God the judge is going to call into account not only nationally but personally. Every human being as an individual will stand before God. It will be a fixed day when their life will be laid bare before the Lord. I think that might be why Jesus warned, repent, or you shall all likewise perish. What's God's ultimate purpose in this earth? Well, God has a heavenly family and God has an earthly family. <coughs> And God wants to unite these two families, and that's his redemption plan. God's ultimate purpose is that one day there will be unconditional, absolute surrender of all nations and all people to the Lord. In fact, because he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death of the cross, God hath highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, Every tongue will confess of things in the heavens, things in the earth, things under the earth, that Jesus Christ is God, that he is Lord. 
to the glory of God. That's what's happening. That's what's going to happen in the future. I suggest that there's anyone that has not yet unconditionally surrendered their heart and their life to the Lord, you do it now and not when you have to. Because then it will be too late if you haven't done it in this life. It's not that we face a pantheon of false gods like Israel did. But we face pressure from a pantheon of false values that we Americans have to recognize and, and fight against. False values like materialism and money. False values like the love of leisure, like sensuality and self-focus and security, and the list goes on. But I think what we ought to end with is simply this, that every human being worships. All people worship. And whatever it is that you worship, you are transformed into the image of that whatever that you worship. Jesus also said, you can't serve two masters. You either hate one and love the other. You despise one and love the other. And also, remember, in that same chapter, he said this. Don't worry about things. Don't worry about material things. Don't even worry about uh, your basic needs, because that's what people that our idolaters do. They worry even uh, they worry about their basic needs. And he says, but your heavenly father knows what you need. And he says, so instead of worrying about those basic needs, seek God, seek the kingdom of God, and him, and everything you need, he'll see to it that it's supplied. You know, God often allows ungodly people to amass great wealth, and it ends up being to their destruction. But if you're someone that God's dealing with, if you put the pursuit of riches or anything else for that matter before a relationship with the Lord Jesus, God might take away those things until you turn to him. Sometimes that's the way he does it. Let me share a story with you. Some years ago, a pastor in Philadelphia uh, was on the sidewalk in front of his church uh, after an evening service. And uh, he was talking with a young woman on the sidewalk. And uh, she wanted to be famous. Uh, she wanted to pursue a, a career uh, on Broadway in New York. She said, after I have made it in theater, I'm going to follow Christ completely. Well, the pastor took a key out of his pocket. And there was a, mail, a mailbox where you mail your letters. And he took that key and he just made a, a little scratch on that uh, on that mailbox, and he says, that's what God will let you do. God will let you scratch the surface of success. He'll let you get close enough to the top to know what it is, but you'll never be able to have it, because he'll never let one of his children have anything rather than himself. Years later, he met that same woman, and she confessed that that indeed was her life story. She had dabbled on the stage once her picture had been in a national magazine, but she had never quite made it to the top. And she told the pastor, I can't tell you how many times in my discouragement I have closed my eyes and I've seen you scratching on that post office box with your key because God let me scratch the edges, but he gave me nothing in place of himself. Some of you have been there. Some of you know exactly what this young woman is talking about. Some of you don't. Some of you are young yet, and you haven't experienced the fact that there is absolutely nothing that satisfies the human soul apart from a personal, deep, growing, intimate relationship with the Lord. You think that you have this, and that that's what your life goal is. And you're going to, like this young woman, find out if you are a believer, you're never going to make it to the top. 
because God would not allow anything to replace himself in you. So I would just suggest to anyone and everyone, listen to me, that if you have not yet trusted Jesus as your Savior, you need to turn to him today and delay no longer because there's coming a day, as Paul says, that uh, he has appointed a day in which the Lord will judge every human being in righteousness. And you need to be ready for that day. And I would also say that if you are a professed believer in the Lord, here is the time for you to just give it all up and give yourself to him. Don't mess around. Don't waste your life. You young people in particular, don't waste your life trying to run after the things that this world <coughs> offers. It's an, it's an illusion. It's not real. It's not reality. It won't make you happy in the long run. You won't be satisfied. You won't find fulfillment if you bypass the very reason why you are here. And that is to be in a living relationship with the Lord, doing what his will is. Let him have your life today if you haven't given it to him yet. Don't let anything, don't let anything vie for his, himself in your life.